thank you very much for joining me in this session two, which is uh, part of the risk communication lectures. And this lecture is called Engaging with Communities. Um, my name is Lisa Bowden. I'm a professor of population medicine and veterinary public health policy based at the Global Academy of Agriculture and Food Security at the University of Edinburgh. This is part of uh, the EU FMD series in this course. The intended learning objectives for this particular lecture are to describe the components of a community engagement plan at different stages of an outbreak, whether you're talking about anticipation, response, or recovery, to think about and describe methods to engage with farmers and their networks in order to be able to understand risk perception, and then to design an appropriate crisis communication approach for different stakeholder groups in a set of different scenarios, and we'll practice this in the live session. We discussed in uh, a number of the previous lectures uh, what risk communication is. We've defined it. We've understood what a risk communication strategy might look like from a very high level approach. Um, and we've talked about it in the context of a risk governance framework where risk communication um, is part of a risk analysis approach, which brings together risk assessment and uh, risk management and risk perception. But there are a number of theoretical models that it's worth introducing you to here um, because they pertain specifically to the way that we might engage with communities. So there are five um, different models, frameworks, theories that are listed here. And I, I wanted to draw on these and provide some references for you for you to do some further reading so that you can um, understand the rationale for a certain uh, inclusions in any strategy to develop messaging or communications um, specifically with farmers at different stages during an outbreak. The first model I want to introduce you to is the risk perception model. Um, this is the idea that people's beliefs about uh, uh, risk are as important as what the real risks are. So at the moment, people perceive um, that we're exposed to greater, more serious risks than previously in history, and it doesn't really matter or not whether that's true. What matters is why they perceive this risk. Um, and this is what's critical to understanding how best to communicate. So thinking about risk in terms of um, their uh, participation and whether it's voluntary in terms of risk mitigation strategies or interventions, the equity with which um, people feel that risk or inequity as it happens, um, the uncertainty around uh, exposure to the risk, but also the outcomes as a result of that risk and the consequences of that risk whether or not exposure and the outcomes are happen to be reversible, the origin of the risk and whether it's human centric or whether it's a naturally occurring risk changes people's per perceptions and beliefs about it. And um, lastly and importantly, two things, that is people's agency, that is their ability to do something about their exposure and um, how they feel about that exposure, like whether or not they are worried or angry or anxious or hostile can change the effectiveness of different messaging. So an important rationale to consider when thinking about approaches with farmers or any um, target audience. The mental noise model was introduced by Covello in 2001, and it's really about how individuals process information under that level of stress. So if you have a high level of anxiety, it reduces your ability to process information. And what they found is that if you provide people with a mental model or a conceptual map um, it, and bring people with you, it helps people understand risk. And it also improves the communication of that risk and the likelihood of them of the target audience to um, take up different actions or interventions which might mitigate that risk. But that's what's critical to this is basically being able to understand a layperson's belief about disease and disease transmission in this particular case, if we're talking about a hazard like an animal um, infectious disease. And if you understand people's beliefs or, and importantly, the gaps in their knowledge about that, it can help in the translation of technical information to provide understandable messages that really resonate with the audience. And in order to be able to address this, often um, operationalizing this model is really um, thinking that through in-depth interviews um, and then targeting not just a single uh, message, but putting out repeated um, messaging in different formats so that it's highly accessible and understandable. The negative dominance model um, is recognizes that people focus on negative outcomes when they're anxious. So they focus on their losses rather than gains. And the strategy, therefore, in risk communication here is to counterbalance that negative messaging with positive solution oriented messaging and focus really on what's being done rather than what's not being done. 
Um, and you can see some of those um, strategies playing out at the moment with COVID-19 in terms of vaccination. In Scotland, we have um, a, a public awareness campaign that's focusing on what we've achieved so far and um, and not so much on what's left to go, but it's to help us get us through to the end of this um, uh, this campaign, this public health campaign. Trust is really important and trust determination theory um, uh, recognizes that people might lose trust in public authority, that trust may be eroded, particularly um, if there's uncertainty attached to anxiety, fear um, and upset. Um, so uh, coming at this as an unknown um, spokesperson uh, from an unknown organization means that uh, you have to work very hard to establish trust in the middle of a crisis. And trust building really needs to occur over longer periods of time and typically in advance and in anticipation of a crisis so that there are active practice routes of communication between different groups and stakeholders. And proactive community outreach reach here is critical as well as honest communication, coherent communication and consistent communication. But importantly, when uncertainty is high and there are chances of getting things wrong, acknowledging where you've made errors um, goes a long way to building trust. Um, and lastly, we talked about this in other lectures, but accountability for the messages uh, that you send out um, uh, when they're right or wrong is critical too. Lastly, the knowledge to action or sometimes um, knowledge uh, to action to practice model. This is um, a paper by Graham et al. that was published in 2006 and then reprinted in Field et al. in 2014. Um, the basis behind knowledge to action theory uh, is that um, it when you provide people information, they don't always change their behavior. So creating knowledge and then um, operationalizing that knowledge are two, set, seen as two different systems. And you can see on the right hand side here the diagram that comes from that paper, Graham et al., um, where we're talking about knowledge inquiry synthesis and producing tools, so tailoring the knowledge, um, alongside the use of identifying the problem um, through an action cycle and adapting that knowledge to a local context so that the, that the interventions become acceptable. Um, and so that uh, that there is a sustained use of that knowledge um, that's then monitored and evaluated um, in, uh, uh, in the audience. Part of that knowledge to action um, uh, framework is really about understanding the and accessing and assessing the barriers to knowledge use, which prevents people either um, inadvertently or uh, willingly from actually changing behavior. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So what is community engagement? It's slightly self-evident, I suspect, but um, engaging the, with the community is about relationship building. And that's usually done over the long term. Um, and it usually is about trying to establish equal partnerships. In this case, um, for example, between veterinarians and farmers, but it could be between um, public health or veterinary public health authorities and um, industry leaders and veterinarians and farmers. Um, and those relationships are trusted um, and sustained um, over time, even if the people in those organizations might change. Community engagement is about inclusivity. So co-designing and developing shared visions for collective beneficial future, whatever that future happens to be. In this context, it would be about trying to eradicate disease and move towards disease freedom. And it's about using locally appropriate um, information to inform decision making, to meet stakeholder needs um, and to address uh, and to keep in mind that in context, the norms, behaviors, values, beliefs, so that the decisions and the interventions that are designed are acceptable to the community and that will be taken up. Community engagement is uh, really critical and there are six kind of key points that I wanna make here. Um, it's critical because the emergency, in this case, a disease outbreak is fast moving. And we talked about this as well. People have a right to information regarding risks to their lives and livelihoods. And um, it's a challenging environment in which to work because there's increased anxiety and demand, not just from stakeholders themselves, but also from the people who are responding to uh, the outbreak. Uh, 
there are lots of people involved in a disease outbreak that are not limited to the veterinary or agricultural sector, the farming community, but extend out into the rural economy, um, like uh, tourism, small businesses, um, and involve different sectors. So moving out with of agriculture into human public health, into water, energy, wildlife. Um, so engaging with the right communities um, and identifying who those communities are and where the leaders are and the influencers are within those communities is critical. Community engagement is important because it puts the community at the heart of the response and the communication strategy during a disease emergency. So it really um, empowers, it's meant to empower those um, individuals who may shoulder the burden of the risk um, and acknowledges that they play an important role in mitigating incursion and disease spread. Um, it, it is critical because it um, involves an understanding of who are the hard to reach and vulnerable communities. So who are the communities that are um, affected by the hazard and risk and why may they or may, may they not be disproportionately affected? And in line with that, it's about then understanding the, the subsequent needs and the impact of that emergency on them. And as I said, um, uh, it involves communities in the co-design of locally appropriate and acceptable responses. The people who are involved in community engagement um, are will vary from um, emergency to emergency. So, um, but they can be thought of at different levels at international, um, national, regional, local. Um, and span the private sector, the public sector, the third sector. So they include international organizations and government representatives, but also non-governmental organizations, volunteers, civil societies, and religious organizations. They include funders or donors, the private sector um, in terms of thinking about innovation, logistics, and supply chains, affected communities from different sectors. So they might be farmers, um, but you might want to think about those communities in terms of the commercial sector, or the backyard sector um, and influencers. So thinking about um, the context in which those individuals at risk are situated. So who are the key groups and community officials and leaders that people listen to in the political, religious and traditional spheres? Who are the key national heroes that have a voice um, that people uh, want to follow, who are the celebrities and who are the champions of this um, type of communication. This is really important for the exercise um, to understand what types of activities are included in community engagement. So um, community engagement might just be about uh, social mobilization and increasing awareness for a particular objective, um, maybe done in anticipation. It might be about outreach and training programs to build up capacity, whether that's in communication exercise itself, or maybe it's about um, teaching farmers how to observe and identify disease. Um, and equally, it's about education. So um, building up the cohort of people who are necessary uh, to be involved in an outbreak response. But equally, those activities might be about specific time sensitive uh, or time bound um, interventions. So about promoting animal health and biosecurity in terms of um, specific behavioral changes and the impact that that causes. Um, actual um, risk communication in advance um, when thinking about horizon scanning or in the context of a response and recovery mode. Um, and outbreak emergency crisis communication, which happens um, in a very time sensitive way when uncertainty is high and um, the outcomes are unclear. This um, is about looking uh, at the different steps of community engagement and the diagram on the right comes from the WHO and that's been modified from the US Department of Health and, and Human Services and the Victoria government. Um, there are some key elements of a farmer engagement activity. First and foremost, you need to inform um, individuals about decisions. So you'll involve the community, you provide that community with information, and then you establish communication channels and channels for outreach. You then consult uh, the community about decisions, build awareness and understanding. Um, that might require quite a broader audience um, of engagement. Um, but you also use that consultation to get um, feedback so you're not just disseminating information, you're getting feedback from the community and you're developing connections, which might be long-term sustainable connections for the future. 
you're involving the farmers and other stakeholders inside decision making. Um, and that requires more energy and participation and more resources um, to bring communities into certain issues. And, and ideally, you're doing that in advance. Um, and there's a, a high visibility of those partnerships, um, which improves long term cooperation. You then want to collaborate um, in order to co-construct recommendations and options for acceptable um, action. So again, this is labor intensive, requires expertise, moderation, um, time, but it's about forming partnerships with the community for different projects or um, different um, strategies from development all the way to the solution. So think back to the lecture on the theory of change and the spheres of influence and who would be important um, at those different um, for different outputs and then outcomes. And then lastly, it's about thinking about how you take a sustainable approach. So a good strategy for communication is about ultimately empowering farmers to take on leadership. Um, so it's about sharing uh, that leadership and enhancing implementation for positive change. But really, ultimately, um, it, it demonstrates uh, and rests upon a very strong relationship in which um, there's a defined partnership formed. And, and <clears throat> ultimately, that's a bi-directional relationship where there's um, opportunities for reflexive um, decision making and uh, long term governance. And what those different um, approaches uh, mean are really like a continuum along a spectrum that you can think about in terms of time, but you can also think about in terms of different stages of development. They require different degrees of, of trust and relationship building and different degrees of time which, over which those partnerships have been built. And to some degree, some of them are very informal approaches, whether others are must be more formalized and rehearsed and part of exercises. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of these in a minute. The phases of engagement in the readiness that is in the contingency planning and preparedness phase is about um, working with the community to identify the goal, learning very much about the demographics and the culture and the values and shared beliefs understand the spheres of influence that can um, that are important which demands you to really understand and know the stakeholders mapping the stakeholders and the community engagement mechanisms that already exist and then build those trusted um, partnerships again if you think back to one of the first lectures that i gave um, the precursor for any strategic um, approach to risk communication is built on leadership and governance and political will so that has to be in place um, in addition to capacity and uh, information and technology systems in order to be able to share um, this information. So we've identified stakeholders and then you need to decide roles, responsibility in the process of communication. And that is going to depend on how formalized a communication structure you have, whether or not you're just disseminating information and mobilizing the public or whether or not you're actually engaging them in a bi-directional flow. And then, of course, rehearsing communication channels through inclusion and simulation exercises is critical, too, if you want to see how and where these communication strategies might um, fall down in real life. Inside an emergency in the um, in the early phases in particular, it's about communicating first and frequently, mobilizing community strengths and resources to action ensuring that you're going out and spending resource to try and identify vulnerabilities and define what those vulnerabilities are to new and emerging hazards, but also look at hard to reach populations which might not be targeted by the appropriate media communication channels. There's a coordination that has to happen at local, subnational, national levels, and the actions, of course, have to be prioritized and aligned with resource allocation and, and um, knowledge of a budget. But ultimately, what you're trying to do is scale this up and, and um, empower the community that, with whom you're engaging to take action themselves and to own those actions so that they have a stake in um, the outcome and that is in disease eradication. Lastly, uh, in the recovery phase, when you're coming out of the outbreak, um, there needs to be a shared vision of what that looks like. So people need to be embedded and on the same page about what um, what the end goal is and what success looks like so that they come alongside the decision makers and um, uh, in, in the long term strategy. Um, stakeholders need to be incorporated into monitoring and evaluation activities and in particular the setting of different indicators which measure success. 
And there needs to be a process embedded where there's dynamic listening. So you're flexible to the changing demands and feedback of things that have gone well, but also things that have gone badly. So there has to be a process ahead of time in order to monitor these. One thing that's not here um, on this list, but I mentioned um, uh, elsewhere is that it's really important when monitoring and evaluating um, a communication plan that you have some sense of the baseline uh, knowledge, understanding, beliefs, and risk perceptions of the community before you start to implement your strategy and that, that these indicators are comparable to what you'll be measuring during your communication strategy so that you um, can respond and appropriately but also uh, understand where things are going well or, or going badly. Mapping the stakeholder um, stakeholders is a, a critical precursor to this if you're going to understand not just um, uh, what you're going to do in a new way during a crisis, but um, what existing communication channels are, are already there. Um, but equally, you need to understand the population at risk. So it's about trying to characterize the demography of the population, um, whether that's the population of the farmers or the population of the animals themselves. But in terms of the farmers and with whom you're communicating, understanding issues like age, gender, mobility, access to broadband, literacy, education levels, health, their vulnerability, um, and access to information is important before trying to design a way to engage, and it will influence what you do to engage with them. The environment in which they're sitting and the infrastructure that they have available to them will tell you something about the barriers uh, to different types of interventions and why perhaps there might be gaps in the information to action um, phase of a plan. Similarly, understanding uh, the economics behind decision making and trade. Um, cultures, traditions, ethnicity and social values, which can play an important part in different types of behaviours. Um, and then their understanding particularly and specifically about the hazard that's posing the risk and what their beliefs are and where the knowledge gaps are in that. And lastly, um, it's, it's critical to have a broad sense when you're mapping stakeholders of those who are active or passive resistors of communication um, objectives or supporters. In other words, um, there will be some people who actively block your um, messaging. There's some people who will passively block your messaging, but equally there'll be some who are actively championing it or passively support it. And the key here is to move the blockers um, into um, more passive resistors and the passive resistors into passive supporters and the passive supporters to become champions um, so that you're constantly trying to engage at all levels of society. What underpins that is really whether or not um, there's trust between the communicator and the person with whom you're communicating. And these are some critical uh, characteristics uh, that are important, difficult to do um, and requires time. But um, the key messages are empathy, flexibility, timeliness, specificity, consistency, transparency, honesty, and credibility. And credibility, of course, is um, part of trust to, that's somewhat redundant but empathy is about listening to audiences in a dynamic way acknowledging their beliefs their concerns in an authentic way recognize their perceptions their wants their needs and maybe also where there might be gaps in information it's if you can do that then you're able to be more flexible because then you can feed back into a strategy and plans of action depending on the information you're receiving and you can pretest messaging to see whether or not it will be successful sticking to a plan that doesn't work is not a successful risk communication strategy think of it as an iterative and very much live approach um, we've mentioned already that especially if you're in crisis uh, situation so in an outbreak early announcements um, are really important um, and um, being very clear about uh, who does what, when, where, and for how long. So specificity about the messaging is, is, is vital as well. Any ambiguity about that can lead to confusion, uh, loss of trust, and loss of uptake. The messaging needs to be consistent, so um, it's often better to produce multiple consistent and coherent messages than a single message. Um, and disseminate those over multiple channels, like we talked about channels in another presentation, I think. 
Transparency is being making public the results of the evaluation and reviews, even the not good ones, um, and admitting your mistakes and what you don't know is also critical too, in order for people to um, believe uh, and understand that you're human and that you are part of um, uh, the, the, the response as well as um, somebody who's giving advice. And lastly, of course, all of that goes to um, influence your credibility. Um, but credibility is also built ahead of time. So whether or not you're a recognized spokesperson, whether or not you're engaging with recognized and trusted leaders in the community, whether or not you're giving those skills and empowering the community to do that um, is important. And of course, the visibility of your network and your organization and whether that is a trusted organization is important as well. So I referred to it a bit earlier when I talked about informing, collaborating, uh, consulting, but um, if I want to be a little more specific here about our communication objectives, we can think about these things in terms of increasing knowledge, so informing. You can be collecting feedback and preferences about a decision or policy that's a pull mechanism that's consulting. Um, and then ultimately where you're trying to get to is about exchanging information in a dialogical approach so that you're then turning that action into practice, um, knowledge action and practice at the bottom. Um, just a little bit about these push models. Um, a one-way transmission of information um, assumes that gaps exist due to ignorance, that, that information um, then becomes knowledge and then becomes in a change in behavior and attitudes. And I've already said that actually that isn't the case. Um, because there's often enablers and inhibitors which prevent that from happening. This is a really overly simplistic approach um, and it's an unnecessary characterization of audiences as ill-informed, but sometimes it's just useful if you're trying to mobilize um, society and you want to get out messages um, in a, a very large way. Um, but it isn't particularly good for vulnerable communities or communities at risk. Collecting uh, feedback, which is a consultative uh, mechanism, is the poll model. And, and often this is done through focus groups or industry interface meetings, um, usually with industry leaders um, or uh, political, religious or community leaders or people within peer to peer networks. And uh, this is done, as I mentioned, um, either you could do this through individual interviews or you could do this through focus groups or questionnaires and surveys. Lastly, the dialogical model, which is the exchange model or co-determination model, is where you improve uptake and compliance of animal health policy decisions in between emergencies by engaging um, and building relationships with the community. It's very labor intensive um, because it's about long term relationship building um, and uh, sustainable engagement. So sustained meetings and inclusion of stakeholders from the outset inside project design. But what that does mean is that when there is a disease emergency, you can pivot quickly into rapid decision making, um, disseminate information through um, acceptable pathways to impact and develop trust in times of risk and uncertainty. So if we look at the little image here, it's about um, uh, building those relationships to ground truth, one's assumptions and the assumptions um, of the stakeholders, build trust, interest, loyalty, and of course, amplify this, the, the message you're trying to send. In order to do that, you have to really include farmers in preparedness efforts pre-crisis to find that opportunity for dialogue, communicate risk, um, and create in pathways to impact. But fundamentally, that allows you to um, future-proof contingency plans for disease outbreaks. Um, and formalizing it in this way is a really helpful thing to do, even if it's labor intensive. The types of engagement that you might choose will depend very much on your knowledge of uh, the stakeholder groups who are most at risk and who are most vulnerable and who are hard to reach. Um, and, it, and you will need to understand uh, the constraints of those groups, um, some of the demographics that we mentioned, um, and uh, be able to pick a type of approach that will suit the different stakeholders best. And sometimes you might pick one, but you might pick more than one of these. These include things like community mapping and discussion and focus groups, which I mentioned, which is you know roughly six to eight people. 
You can choose individual interviews, or you can either do those very cheaply and quickly by doing sort of a five to 10 minute interview, or you could do a longer in-depth interview over the telephone or face-to-face -face, um, with a person spending perhaps an hour or two with them. You could extend that um, into an ethnographic approach by doing household and farm observations, including farm walks, where you're videoing or asking the farmer to video their experiences as they walk and tell um, you what they're doing. You can engage people with storytelling or calendars and historical timelines to try and take people through the long term or short term drivers of different disease outbreaks. You can use simulation exercises um, if you have a long term relationship with partners where you have um, formalized processes of communication and define roles and responsibilities. And um, lastly, uh, in terms of long term future proofing for communication and strategic um, building, you can include uh, stakeholders in scenario planning activities where you are co-creating shared visions for the future. So the positive side, um, the opportunities that this creates is there's there's a great opportunity for social learning for both the people who are the risk communicators and the communities at risk. Um, there's a creation of new relationships and understandings built on trustworthiness, and it off, off, offers you an opportunity to think about um, different alternative viewpoints and develop empathy uh, um, in terms of how people will experience the same event in a different way. And of course, it then um, provides a platform by which you can generally increase the knowledge base of the community over time. On the other hand, um, there are some constraints to different approaches. Um, so if you are looking at, at uh, focus groups where there are different people from different sectors, you need to establish ground rules. It's clear that um, that there will be some confirmational bias in, in, in the people who um, bring uh, different beliefs. There'll be different ideological viewpoints and plurality of stakeholder views um, and power dynamics. So you'll need good moderation and expertise and experience in conducting these. Um, and of course, that's in combination with the time constraints. So being able to mobilize quickly um, is critical. And that does require some in, in pre-crisis training, expertise and moderation. In a group setting, um, it's very difficult for sensitive uh, information sharing and you have to be very conscious um, and thoughtful about um, the experiences of people along um, lines of race, gender um, and other types of abilities or um, accessibility. So thinking in particular about vulnerability is important here. Uh, lastly, I think there's some challenges just to be aware of, mindful of. Um, stakeholder engagement is really difficult to do over long periods of time. You need good investment um, and expertise and skills and people have to place importance on it and have to value uh, or have to appreciate the stakeholder as an equal partner. The positionality and power structures can change um, communication methods and make communication really challenging. So as I said before, you have to respect differences and diversities between groups and understand the community dynamics, which really means um, taking a, a, an interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary approach and bringing in the right expertise at the right time. So uh, social scientists and, um, and scientists and researchers from the humanities and the arts are really critical to involve here alongside um, community leaders. The vulnerable and hard to reach communities need to be included, but need to be found. So there's resource required there that's at the human level, but also potentially um, financial. And lastly, um, we talked about uh, the um, uh, the theories behind trust and, and uh, fear, uh, anxiety, um, dismissal and distrust are, are all reasons that there might be per uptake of interventions um, as a result of risk communication failures and result in a failure to change behavior and a failure to achieve the outcomes that you want. So um, my last summary is um, in thinking about engagement uh, with communities, um, there are, this is a little chart here, which I hope to, that you might reflect on at the end of this lecture and then come back to the live session um, with some ideas about this. Um, when you're faced with an outbreak, um, understanding where you are inside the outbreak is critical. Um, but I want you to bring together the different lectures that we've seen um, around strategy development, theory of change, um, 
uh, problem trees, understanding how to communicate um, clearly to different audiences and think about what your communication goal is and who your target audiences are and inside your target audiences, what are their needs or their gaps in knowledge, but also their vulnerabilities, their demographics, their beliefs and their values. What engagement activities do you think that you might use out of the list that's in this presentation and elsewhere? What communication channels are gonna be important to do that? And what, what are the rationale and the frameworks that you're using to really, um, uh, to, to hold yourself accountable to why this might work? And then thinking specifically about your key messages, what will your key messages be? And will they change over time? And why would they change over time? What do you think the barriers and risks might be with that approach in that particular context? And lastly, thinking ahead of time about what success looks like. So what outcomes um, are you interested in and are you interested in measuring um, success and, and the indicators of success along the process? So I want you to um, have a think about that before the live session um, and we can have a discussion about that uh, when I next meet you. Uh, with that, I'd just like to say thank you and obviously be in touch if you have any questions or comments about this or the other presentations. I look forward to seeing you in the last week. Thank you.